Good afternoon. We appreciate you joining us today for another in a series uh, of webinars on high-risk alcohol use. The others join us, so we'll start out um, without to just introduce ourselves, and then we'll let others kind of catch up with us. So, Rebecca. Hi, I'm Audrey Young, and I'm the director for the Office of Student Wellness. Today we're going to be using the chat function so that you can ask any questions and uh, Mark Pontius will be forwarding those to us. So if you've used your chat function now to let us know that you can hear us and see us, that way we know we are ready to go. We, of course, I came prepared today with my laptop to be able to look up any information we might need in response to your questions. And it's typically the case that it's decided to install updates. So we're 20% of the way through. I should be 100% so We have Mark working with us here, Mark Pontius from the Parent Family Programs. Thank you, Mark, for your help today. And welcome, everyone. I'm Mike Kerm, Dean of Miami University. Again, appreciate your time and your interest. You're listening today because you care and because you're a, an ally for us with respect to working together to to the success and the happiness of your loved ones. So we really appreciate you being here. Talk narrowly about something called Green Beer today. But of course, get to the Q&A section of this. We'd be happy to entertain any sort of related questions that you may have. So let's talk for a minute about what Green Beer Day is. Now, so importantly, let's talk Green Beer Day isn't. Green Day is not, not a university-recognized event. It is not an Oxford, Ohio-recognized event. Um, they, I would, uh, the, and by, by the way, Wikipedia on this, so you can look that up while we're talking. But it originated effectively as a way for students to celebrate their day, or excuse me, Matrix Day informally at a time when Miami's spring break occurred during St. Patrick's Day holidays. So they were not able to recognize that when they were in session. So I don't know if there's clear attribution as to what students thought it was meant to create a, a separate informal recognition. Uh, but and now um, um, there's a tradition of it. But as I say that, I should note that green beer, in terms of its size and significance, seems to, have, seems to be changing over time. Um, in part, as are being more responsible in their alcohol use. I hope that that's part of the reason. A myriad reasons for it, and if you'd like us to speculate, we could do so in our Q&A, but it would probably be pure speculation. Say a little bit about why we care about Green Beer Day, even though it's in no way a my university recognized event. And as I said, um, President Offord has reached out to you via email with us about Green Beer Day. And so in there, he asked you to talk with your loved ones about their participation in or their understanding of or the dangers associated with Green Beer Day. So thank you for doing that. And the Dean of Students Office just sent an email to all students today to them why we care about Green Beer Day. And in that email, you can ask your student about this email email, comes back to orientation, actually, the standards program that we do orientation, where we try to talk with students about why we care about their alcohol consumption. And the three reasons we give them at orientation about why we care about their alcohol consumption is we're experts, and so we teach respect for the law and the legal drinking age is 21. The first reason. The second reason um, that in observation alcohol misuse is the number one single risk factor in terms of 
preventing students from achieving their goal at Miami, their goals at Miami. We success. That's what Miami University is all about. Alcohol use is the single biggest biggest obstacle to their success. So that's the second reason we care about. And third, alcohol misuse will very frequently interfere with the ability of other students to achieve goals at Miami. So alcohol use has very significant negative external effects on others. And if it deprives of their ability to reach their goals at Miami, we care about it. So we think here with students why we care about their alcohol use and or use. And likewise, in the letter today, we shared with them why we care about Green Beer Day. And the first reason that we provided was was an event that is focused entirely on high risk of consumption. There seems to be no other um, purpose of Green Beer Day other than to promote dangerous and risky drinking. So we care about students and we care about their safety. So it's an ill-advised uh, that students have created for themselves. Secondly, um, they will act members of the media from Cincinnati. The stories will focus around student alcohol misuse, and these will represent the Miami University student community unfairly. It will represent the Miami, Miami University student body as one that's prone to significant misuse of alcohol, when in fact that's not the case. In fact, you may remember from orientation, uh, much to the contrary, 60% of Miami students and Miami University as non-drinkers, meaning haven't had a drink in the last two weeks or they're, they have stayed. Now, of course, this declines over time, but typical Miami student building her or his brand on alcohol misuse, and this event can be portrayed unfairly as something that represents all Miami students. Much like the reasons we care generally about student alcohol misuse, uh, we can safety and using alcohol it presents a lot of issues, particularly with the timing of Green Beer Day. Uh, last uh, can start early on Thursday morning and can last into Friday. And they, many of our students will be driving a deserved spring break trips, driving long distances, and we don't have the activities of Thursday to put students at any more risk than they already are when they're driving perhaps across country for a break. We, we don't want them to be tired. We don't want them to be suffering from the after effects of alcohol. We want them to be driving refreshed so they can get to their destination safe and enjoy a good spring break. Uh, Particulars have uh, maybe dissipated to some degree in spring break, in spring, in the, um, the green beer day. Informed day, they might think it's a good idea to post social media uh, about activities, and with social media posts, can and get reputations and make it difficult for them to uh, post appropriately to future employers and to future graduate schools, and don't want that detriment to the student success be a function of their activity on greener day. So that's here. So we're going to be talking with students about that day, and we're going to do some other things associated with Green Beer Day, and that's what Rebecca's going to talk with you about. Thanks. The Office of Activities has coordinated some events in the Strong Student Center with our student union. During we'll have the opportunity to watch the NCAA games, um, as well as get some pancakes and other um, Activities that revolve around the student union. We know that students will be in class, they will be studying, and uh, perhaps even taking advantage of some time to sleep and rest before spring break. So we really want to stress that these activities should be um, on campus and that our students are welcome to participate in those things that are happening at the student union and encouraged to attend class as usual. Now, I am in a community who cares deeply for our students. So it's not unusual for uh, uh, churches to come out on Green Beer Day and making sure that they're supporting our 
students. So if your student um, chooses to participate in beer day, we want to make sure that they have the opportunity to eat before they go out. We encourage students to alternate their drinks between um, alcohol drinks and water. And we also um, tell them to have a plan for how they will get home before they go out. These are safety tips. In addition, your students will be exposed to the Safe Spring Break campaign, which our Hawks Peer Health Educators are launching uh, this week. The campaign reminds students um, on safety tips, not only on Green Beer Day, but throughout their spring break. It would be um, alcohol use and sun exposure, and alcohol use uh, around large bodies of water, pools, hot tubs. Make sure that all students have the right information to make good choices around their alcohol use. A bit more. Um, Rebecca's office does such a great job educating students uh, these, uh, if they're choosing to drink. And we know that some students, uh, 21 year old drinking age, will choose to drink when they're less than 21. Of course, as we do not condone that, but we recognize that. And so that it, those messages that the wellness office provides um, are really appropriate for a student who's going to drink, whether they're of legal drinking age or not. But let's see what Green Beer Day looks like, because some may be surprised by this, even if you're talking with your student about Green Beer Day. Let's talk about what we think it looks like. like um, we, all students, will treat this just like any other Thursday. There's a lot of things to do, like go to class that Thursday, Late, you can enjoy the NCAA tournament game, which will be in full wing. Start of day, which many of us look months forward to. But when Green Beer Day is house parties, word will pop up starting at about two or two sometimes, believe it or not. And that's a uh, we think students get a little sleep. Some students might be up all. Wednesday night waiting to Thursday morning. We don't know, but we think that most students asleep. They set their alarm uh, for 30, and there'll be multiple house parties up town. Mm -hmm. And the legal time that bars can open in Oxford or in Ohio is 5:30, and so the students are going to queue up to um, a couple of establishments uptown. Probably about five o'clock for the 5:30 opening. And what really attracts the attention of the media? They love to capture the student in line and uh, entering um, assessments clubs or being on the front yard of house parties early in the morning when the sun isn't even up yet. I want you to know that there'll be a um, large police presence in Oxford that day. Again, for students' safety. Uh, more than anything else, but we'll have police from um, uh, Miami University, Oxford City, Oxford Township, Butler County, and uh, Department of Public Safety uh, staffers in Ohio will be present as well. And so you're safe, we hope, with the police presence. But more importantly, we hope there be because of the message, messages that we're trying to convey to them about they choose to participate in this event. The excellent messages that Rebecca's office has been sending out about how to be smart about it gets through to them. Many of us will, in fact, go to class that day, and the provost and, uh, and sent a note out to uh, fat reminds them of the day that, that reminds that this is a class day just like any other day, and our, our expectations for students should now we're on this day and in fact should be higher to reward the students, most students, by the way, who are making the right choices. But Rebecca, you, you can say a little bit more about the bars are open at 5.30 and then there's a little bit more of a kind of a rhythm to the day after that. Certainly. So we see a lot of specials in the morning uh, to attract the students to these establishments. After um, several, several hours, the students will take a break. Um, some go to class. Some will go home for a nap. Um, some will decide to socialize in other ways. What we say is the house parties start to rejuvenate. Um, 
parties will start to kick in around 5 o'clock and students will resume their Green Beer Day activities. Late evening, about 11 o'clock, you see the bars have a resurgence of activity. So from 11 until 2 a.m., the bars will have specials and attract students to their establishments to continue the Green Beer Day celebration. I think what Mike could speak to even is that the name Green Beer Day is a bit misleading. It's not beer. They have all kinds of drink specials. Indeed. In fact, the sense in which if um, we talk with students, as we talk with community partners, to move that uh, more of a focus on, on only beer, although we don't view that as the ideal outcome, Outcome. The ideal outcome would be for students to recognize that there's value in the event so that they would abandon it. But if the students continue to embrace it for reasons that are somewhat outside of my understanding, um, to put into a zone that's less risky by putting emphasis on green beer, which in fact is a common element of St. Patrick's Day celebrations, the green beer. And so, to their credit, the Interfraternity Council and Pan Hell, this is actually a, a broader issue at Miami in our efforts to combat high risk alcohol consumption because we believe that inter taught appropriately a drink of equivalence that a 12 5% beer, uh, e five ounces of 12% uh, wine, which you equals um, ounces of 40 proof liquor, those equivalents in a theoretical way are really important for students to understand as they're going to do the right thing. But we need to assemble data which tell the story that in actual usage, that as students actually use hard alcohol, I mean, perhaps more generally in the millennial in um, the Gen Z, and use hard alcohol with the intent to become intoxicated. And we all believe that as they use hard alcohol with the intent to become intoxicated, it's static because if someone is to set out the goal of becoming intoxicated, or if it are not, sometimes students in game session with the intent of blacking out. Um, it's much more difficult to actually manage that goal and to accomplish that goal using hard alcohol quickly before the signs of its impact become apparent. You can measure when you're pouring by hand. And so, magically, hard alcohol can be much more dangerous than beer, for example, which comes be, uh, measured and easily be counted. And is tuned over longer periods of time, traditionally. Now, again, uh, we think that it would be beneficial for us to begin to move student use, particularly when they're engaged in high risk, more toward beer and wine and away from what we think to be more dangerous hard alcohol. We're not fooling ourselves, though. We and students can misuse beer and hard uh, beer wine, just as can, hard alcohol, it's harder to accomplish that. And so we have been trying to move Green Beer Day into one um, in terms of conversations with IFC and Pan Hell, and they've adopted it. We age the permit holders and try to get them interested in um, maybe on this campaign to focus on beer and as opposed to hard alcohol, and Rebecca Wright is right on. And if you have thoughts about that as parents, or maybe some um, physicians or some substance abuse specialists who are parents out there, we would love to be sort of on the cutting edge, I think, nationally of some of the things that are going on from reducing high risk consumption. Do you have any questions, Mike? Yeah, so I think this is the time if you have questions, please um, enter them. We have an hour 
schedule this and we're all thankful for parents actually who are participating in these in real time because we know your time is valuable. Um, many of the Miami parents who are on the line with us, most of you are accomplished and uh, are maybe at work right now. And so that's another reason that we are taping this. Joe and Mark will put out a note on the parent page to know that this will be taped. And could you, as we're for a question, which we'll get to in a second, but I just remind you, and I, I think Rebecca up on this, but do not underestimate the, the role that you play as parents. And I, I think you get that because you're on this webinar, but Rebecca knows the research well as well, but what you say matters. And so if you have a conversation with your, your student this week, ask them, ask your loan, are you going to be set your alarm at two o'clock so you can go to a party that starts at 2.30 on thir Thursday morning so that you can drink? If you are going to do that, why are you going to do that? And if you do do that and you ask at a bar outside where the media will be gathered looking just for a student, to pick to exploit um, to really Miami and Miami students and Oxford look bad. Um, you might encourage them to, to um, indulge the camera and give their, their wrist response. Um, you know what we mean. We your students' reputation damage, and you don't want your students' reputation damage. For the relationship of parents and students in our campaign to Consumption. Absolutely. We actually um, have several messages for parents on the parent website page and other webinars like this to learn about uh, the messages that the university is sending to students as well as support for parents on how to have good conversations with their students. We encourage uh, parents ongoing conversations, not just before you drop them off here, throughout their college experience because we know that their attitudes and behaviors around alcohol can change. And so it's good for you to be having those conversations just to check in and let them know what your expectations are. Um, as Mike alluded to, there's a significant research that says students continue to listen to their parents and what their parents think about their alcohol use matters to them. So I encourage you to have those conversations for additional tips and information. Go to the parents' website page. You can look at some of those archived uh, webinars. Related topics, and then we'll get to a question. Parents help us also if, when you're talking with your students about this uh, among more general issues that you have, something called the Miami Student Health Survey, which I'm due in, in those Dean of Students and Rebecca's role in the wellness office constitutes the most important thing we get from students in terms of helping us serve them. And it's a survey that, that we created at Miami, which lined three other existing surveys into one, because it's related to three issues that significantly overlap. Those issues being alcohol use, interpersonal violence, and mental health challenges. And those issues are the just impediments to students at Miami. And if you encourage your students, they've been invited by the president, they've been invited via email by me, the dean of students, they've been invited by um, a local searcher that partners with on this survey. If you could encourage your students to complete that survey, that would be immensely important to our efforts to understand and to respond to just that they face, that those issues face. If you're a student who is living off campus, the uh, question is, do we share this information with students? So I'll kind of segue into that, and then I'll say something, and then let Rebecca also go. And, but we share this information with students. But, for example, I just emailed the students a note from the Dean of Students Office about a half an hour before this session. And we don't know if they messages from us. If you could encourage them to read that message, it 
the reasons why we, we care about them and why we care about green beer today, why we care about their alcohol use. But then it all reminds them that there's going to be a big police presence in I noted earlier. And if they become intoxicated, which is against state law, or if they drink their age, which is against the law, there's a good likelihood that they're going to be cited. And we don't want ours to have a uh, law that's going to have a long-run negative consequence on that. We want our students to be successful. And if they run in with the law, it could be that they get back to the residence hall room and they create a disturbance and they get written up by their A and they end up in our judicial office, our Office of Ethics and Student with Resolution. And start two or three alcohol violations based on very mandatory suspension. And it's not as a matter of trying to be punitive. It's a matter of if our students are engaging in behavior where they're getting two or three alcohol violations, they're not getting their time at my university, so they probably need to be somewhere else. Um, Rebecca, any more on do we share this information with students? So we have ongoing campaigns throughout the year um, to raise awareness about alcohol use. But more importantly, today and tomorrow, there's a Green Beer Day Forum. It is a forum that is sponsored by Associated Student Government and our residence hall at an uh, RA's association. And they bring in uh, officers from the Oxford Police Department, from the Miami Police Department, and the Dean of Students to just, for them to have a question and answer session. Session, so they can fully understand the consequences that they would face um, on Green Beer Day so that they can ask questions of what the event is like and um, hopefully to gain some support in their decision to not drink. So um, those two events will be happening today and tomorrow for students as well. Historically, this event has been wildly popular and attended by hundreds of students. So um, we do feel like it's a good venue for students to come and get some questions answered um, from the authorities. There are some about uh, some of the other alternative programs that are happening on Green Beer Day. As we mentioned earlier, the Student Union will have activities today. Um, most notably, they will be screening uh, the NCAA games. And in our Student Union, we have gigantic, gigantic screens, um, so which um, creates an atmosphere uh, that's very lively during the basketball game. So it should be lots of fun. And again, uh, all we have been encouraged to have. Um, class, as well as gradable experiences that day, tests, quizzes, or turning in papers. So we hope that your student will be in class like any other Thursday. Thank the NCAA for having the large of the games on Thursday. And actually, say that half chokingly, but we think that over the last few years, the significance of this event diminished in part because of, of its overlap with the first week of the tournament. And so there's a lot going on. Students really enjoy, all students enjoy the basketball tournament, the men's and the women's tournament, and having a bracket and watching the games on those days. That is a great built-in alternative for students. And as Rebecca pointed out, the best alternative they have is they can go to class. And they things to do before spring break. So catch up on your work so that you can really relax during spring break. Those are great alternatives. There seems to be questions about specific strategies that are in place. And uh, this might be a good opportunity to talk to you about the Alcohol Coordinating Committee. The Alcohol Coordinating Committee is an institutional committee that also includes um, membership from the Oxford, city of Oxford, um, establishment owners, bar owners, um, as well as uh, concerned uh, um, concerning the Oxford community, and it has faculty, um, it has student affairs professionals, and it has administrators all presented on the committee in which we take and examine this issue very seriously. And if you go to the uh, Miami website, you can go to the alcohol page, which has updates on all the strategies that we've employed, the ones that we have examined, and updates on those. So you can check that out, and you can look at um, some of the specific strategies that look like they're being addressed in these questions. And in fact, on that site, you can also find letters mm -hmm. that, that addressed very comprehensively, I think, the approach that uh, Rebecca uh, is leading on our, our response to high risk alcohol consumption. Uh, this is over an hour long. I would urge you to listen to it. There's others on there as well. And 
there seems to be in our theme, by the way, in our questions, a theme related to bars. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say a bit about bars and clubs, and then I'm gonna let Rebecca jump in. And uh, if you have some follow-up questions, we'd be happy to um, address those. But let me start by saying that, that I think it's easy to um, vilify founders um, in matters like this. These legal businesses. Um, they're sanctioned by this. They're licensed by the state. Uh, there are specific ways in which they are uh, violating the law. Uh, that becomes known, and they can be cited for that and lose their license. And in fact, permitters have the greatest incentive to abide by the law so that they can continue operation. In fact, for bars and clubs, if you ask me when I entered the Dean of Students office, what my most significant concern was, it certainly would not have been bars and clubs. It was the visible, unregulated open house parties at which uh, underage students were never carded, uh, which there was no guest list, there was no bouncer, there were open handles of hard alcohol, there were jungle juice mixtures, which were concoctions of alcohol and perhaps uh, other drugs mixed in where students had no idea what the content was. And if they were trying to do the right thing and count their drinks, they couldn't because they know what was in these things. And as 21 or 22 year olds hosting these parties in violation of Ohio social hosting laws, uh, these open parties of significant danger because of openness of alcohol for underage students. Our strategy, which is successful because of our partnership with Oxford PD and MUPD, uh, target high risk alcohol, with, target these highly visible open house parties. We're not targeting all house parties by students. We understand that it's college and our students are going to have parties and many of them are legal, legal drinking age, but very dangerous open ones for which pretty much a student could attend for the benefit of the host and the benefit of the attendees to target. And part of that was a sense of uh, fewer dangerous house parties. Some students who can't get into those house parties will still try to drink, but perhaps they'll go up to the bars and the bars and clubs will card them. And we have evidence from work that we do that low bars and clubs do a very good job. In fact, uh, merchants do a very good job of carding, card checking. So that this is true, we uh, participated in a grant called the Alcohol Responsibility Program with um, uh, mystery shoppers actually went around Oxford to check to see if they were checking for IDs. And I think if you ask your student, they'll say that yes, they do check for IDs. The problem though is that excellent fraud identification cards, both driver's licenses and believe it or not, Miami IDs are available. So they're in a tough place that they are checking IDs, but even police can't check these IDs um, and verify them often without calling them in. So I would say that we've got the permit holders who are at the table with us. They're trying to partner with us on uh, there's a question about um, is there a technology about IDs? And it's a great question because there are multiple technologies out there. Miami is partnered with a firm all, then this isn't a plug. It's just uh, the, the firm we're working with, IntelliCheck, that has a platform called Age ID. Uh, they all have a set of patron that bar owners can use. And in fact, they have a other product that, that police departments use. And Miami has provided that ID check authentication software to our police, and they're for free. Uh, we offered the um, IntelliX software to every permit holder in Oxford to use free. Uh, the offer is out there, and if they decide to accept that offer, we will provide on a trial basis IntelliX for free, and that funding would come not from Miami University, not from tax dollars, although I think it would be a, a laudable use of tax dollars, but it comes from parent donations. So thank you, parent donations. Um, and we also do talk with permit holders about um, Green Bay and encourage them to uh, maybe um, charge higher prices and not offer specials for hard alcohol to encourage 
if students are going to drink, um, some portion of novelty helps it. Rebecca can talk a little bit about the awesome work that Associated Student Government, which is a fantastic way, has offered to do in terms of water and food as well. Absolutely. So um, one of the things that we talked about earlier as some strategies to reduce the risk of um, intoxication, that is to eat before you are drinking and to alternate your drinks during the day. Um, we have that message out for students as well as the Associated Student Government as um, a volunteer to pass out uh, water and food um, on a other high risk weekends. Um, but for Green Beer Day, we'll um, have some water, but we're also going to have some coupons with Merchants Uptown so that students can um, part these other businesses that do not serve alcohol, but they do serve food. And so with them to be able to use these vouchers to get some food during the day, um, make sure that they are pacing their drinks, as well as um, having the time out to go and eat and take care of themselves. Um, it brings me to taking care of others. Um, one other strategy that we have um, adopted in recent years is the Good Samaritan policy. And with this to be um, a successful way to communicate to our students the expectations that they also look out for one another. Good Samaritan policy allows for students to um, have a reprieve from judicial consequences. Um, they are calling for medical um, assistance for another student. So if the student uh, that is calling has uh, been drinking, or drinking underage, uh, they have that reprieve from the judicial consequences in order to encourage students to call for um, medical help. This could be taking them to the hospital, this could be calling 911, this could be asking an RA for help. Um, and so we make sure that um, all students know about that. There are active campa campaigns on campus as well as it will be addressed in the Green Beer Day Forum. Today. And again, recognize Rebecca for all the great work of her office. It's Small, immensely mighty, given the work they do, uh, and I think you're hearing about a lot of it here. I want to add, Rebecca is much closer to the age of the students than I am, so I have um, children. Uh, kids, I guess I can't call them children anymore, but uh, I have my kids are um, just recently graduated from Miami, and uh, I have a daughter who is a senior in college, and you know. That fundamentally, the work we do on reducing high risk alcohol consumption must not originate, resonate with students. So, what we did in the fall was work with, and parents, many of you will know this name, it used to be called Laws Hall and Associates. It's a senior level strategic communication and marketing capstone course, which is now called Highwire. We partnered with Highwire, thankfully. Uh, student teams to take on the issue of high risk alcohol consumption at Miami. And they're really outstanding teams. We wanted to name each of them a winner because there were elements of each of their presentations that we thought was best. But the ideas that Rebecca is talking with you about, for example, specifically the idea of partnering with Uptown Oxford merchants who ordinarily don't, are not filled with Green Beard Day because of the um, visual uh, and the fact that it might keep other people out of town that day, but to partner with them to try to get a win to get our students away from the house parties, away from the bars, and up into establishments eating and drinking a Coke or some water. Uh, that was one of the ideas that came from Highwire. Mm -hmm. um, which we're, we're very thankful for. Absolutely. All right, some more questions here. Um, students participate in Green Beer Day. That's hard day. I would say that for the part, um, Green Beer Day is a 21 and up event. In fact, on Green Beer Day, uh, particularly in the bars, everyone will be 21. Now, again, that's uh, assuming that um, the, the fake ideas are not so good that they fool very conscientious uh, dual that work um, at the bars and clubs up town. But the students would tell you, with the culture, a senior event, it's largely a senior event. And in fact, I would say that, again, for underage age 
patients, the biggest participation would be at the house parties, and this is where the extremely dangerous house parties that will um, uh, for Green Beer Day. They, they, there may be underage students there, and again, you to ask your loved one, they rent houses, do know that it's a violation of Ohio social hosting law to let less than 21 drink um, the house that they rent because students are at risk of being arrested for violating Ohio social hosting law. They're at risk of having an alcohol violation in our judicial office. If they are having parties where those that are less than 21 are flagrantly and openly consuming alcohol, this is a risk that for the st- the bars can do it ID check, and if the bars can make sure drinks aren't being passed from those who are 21 to those who aren't, the safety and security of an environment in the bar is definitely better than these unsupervised house parties. Once again, we don't have alcohol and certainly underage alcohol, but the parties I would rank as the most dangerous, followed by the guys in the bars and the clubs. So, we're add to the participation in Green Beer Day and what that event is like. Well, other than I think what differentiates Green Beer Day from other high risk weekends is that um, it's largely a very visible. Um, event. And so when we think about what is the, the, part, the percent of students that participate, it's great left by the fact that it's so visible. Um, when these things are happening on a weekend and it's a Friday or Saturday night, um, most folks aren't out in the town. And the media certainly isn't, isn't here. And, and so we don't see it as much. But Green Beer Day sure brings a different light to the um, high-risk alcohol use. And so that's why we want to make sure that all of our students and all of our parents and all our community members are aware and that we're looking out for each other and getting good information out. About our students um, participating on ACC, the alcohol coordinator, and the answer is yes. yes. On all committees, we invite more student participation in this because the student, the parent who asked the question and know that they should be, we couldn't do more. Mm-hmm. As we alluded to, we think that we have a little opportunity to have an impact on reducing high-risk consumption and let we view students as partners and then we have students who are coming up with many of the ideas themselves. And I'd like to actually take this opportunity to recognize this year's student government, the president and the vice president and the Senate. Um, we spoke with student Senate very recently because of some code changes that we're going to make to code of conduct this year, and we wanted to get their input on that. The student government was um, um, uh, very with their questions. Of course, their advocates for students also realized the dangers that high risk and underage drinking pose, and so they were uh, actually a great forum. And I'll just say briefly the code changes that we're making for next year are, again, we believe that as used by students, hard alcohol poses a greater risk than beer and wine. Uh, We are using to elevate the sanction associated with the possession and use of hard alcohol. So it effectively makes it a major violation and two majors is an automatic suspension, whereas three minors is a suspension. But then also, we recognize that many students are dealing with substance abuse problems, and we have realizing now that they have a challenge for the rest of their life. And we don't want this to be simply punitive, and in fact, we believe even with our suspensions, the time away from Miami can be beneficial for them. But we're also trying to figure out whether we can find a way that um, if student has recognized that they have a substance abuse issue and they are seeking treatment, that we should be able to have a scenario where a student is suspended but serves a suspension in residence. And we have a excellent partner in Oxford now um, called the Hennett College. It is, in my view, the leading uh, partner in higher education 
uh, for treating students in recovery. The awesome partner, they have an affiliation with Hazleton Betty Ford. Uh, so very strong and use many of the Hazleton Betty Ford resources. And we mentioned that students will, for example, accepted responsibility for a second major alcohol violation that recognize that they need help rather than being suspended away from campus or uh, suspension in residence and get treatment exclusively at the Haven because there is no exclusivity. It's the closest recovery outfit in, and it's right in Oxford. And we are very thankful that they're here. And about how else can students uh, work to change the culture? And this is the, the greatest question so far, like this one, because we have many opportunities for students to get involved. So that the Associated Student Government has really taken um, stand on a high-risk alcohol use and wanting to make an impact on that. So certainly talking to their representatives and Associated Student Government is one way. We also have a peer education team called the Hawks, where we have students um, and they are trained through a one uh, credit hour class to become experts in health education um, and peer education. So they do programs across campus. They go to evidence halls and do programs around substance abuse, around sexual interpersonal violence, and other topics around wellness. Uh, these peer health educators also work with our athletic teams and our Greek chapters and uh, serve as a role model on campus. We also have a student organization called Bacchus. And Bacchus uh, hosts many uh, awareness events on campus. And that's another opportunity for students to get involved. And so with Late Night Miami, we have um, several programming boards that help coordinate the Late Miami events. And these are events that happen every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. Um, and late at night, um, it's an opportunity for students to get involved in activities that do not in, um, have alcohol involved. And to that, we are just at the beginning of a significant strategic um, direction Miami, which moves the conversations away from the more reactionary type conversations of the costs of alcohol misuse, sexual and interpersonal violence, and, and mental challenges, and try to move it into a comprehensive and to coordinated effort that recognizes the overlap, the very significant overlap between these three areas, and try to turn it into a conversation more, more approaching the benefits of good health, turn it into a surplus conversation. And it's beginning, one of the things that's going to happen is there will be some differences in the residence halls and the way the residence hall work is coordinated. And the essentially health ambassadors increasingly in our residence halls that will support students in recognition that their, health, their good health is by far and away the most important determinant to their success at Miami and to get to embrace that idea with support. So that be another way of students will be working with us to change the culture. I'll add we have evidence from surveys. That students, that other students drink more than they do, and so also, there's fallacy that some students actually. Well, there's a fallacy that that uh, uh, applaud or to uh, revere other students who misuse alcohol, especially those who black out. And what we find is no that. That three data that we've just been collecting in the last couple of years, students do not uh, view high risk alcohol consumption as something that is desirable. They strongly disagree that it's a good thing that other students misuse alcohol. Strongly disagree that blacking out is in any way okay. But other students think it's okay. So Rebecca and her shop is going to give students the ammunition that they need to correct these norms, correct these norms in the student community, I think create this virtuous cycle. About what can students and parents do when they know that another student may have an alcohol abuse issue? So we have um, 
opportunities for the students if they live in a residence hall to uh, work with their RA or a resident, a resident director. They have been trained through the counseling staff to have the type of conversations that can be helpful in these situations. We also want students to come to the counseling center. Um, they can get other uh, tips on how to have that conversation. And of course, if this is something that they're very concerned about, they shouldn't hesitate to call 911 if there's an active situation in which they fear for the safety of their friend. Um, and also to make the Dean of Students Office aware. And we have terms of resources on campus. So you can use um, our counseling center for substance abuse assessments. We have the Haven and College uh, that have recovery meetings for the, even the recovery curious, which you get more information on the Haven, I think probably through the parent website. And let me add, um, there's been also a couple of questions about why are over serving? And I want to make two, I want to uh, two point on that is, is there's some kind of real rhythm uh, or to student drinking at Miami, and it often involves starting at house parties. Uh, I mean, some are often with the use of hard alcohol, whereas those who are less than 21 might be trying to, in using their terminology, catch a buzz before they go into a bar because they're not even sure they can get a drink in a bar. And the dangerous use of hard alcohol uh, for the end of becoming intoxicated. And they're concerned that they might, might be caught at a bar drinking underage. This leads to a propensity to order multi concoctions inside the bar uh, so they can then continue to keep the buzz going as opposed to having a beer, which might be safer because they fear maybe detection. They might order one of these drinks that has five or six shots. Dangerous. And so I think for the permit holders, they know that they have a responsibility not to serve those who are intoxicated. And this ARP program that we talked about, the Alcohol Responsibility Program, the very interesting program that we did not participate in locally, but we shared with the permit holders where they sent pseudo intoxicated shoppers into the bars and checked whether a uh, certain be cut off for an actor who was clearly demonstrating intoxication. Now, to emphasize that we did not do this in Oxford, but other four other schools that were on this grant that we were involved in did. This is a very important point because the data showed outside of Oxford that tenders were not, not typically cutting off that showed visible signs of intoxication. We talked with our permit holders about would you like to participate in pseudo intoxication because a very good indicator to them and there if their, if their bartenders are violating the law, it would give them uh, something very important that they could then take back to their servers. Um, not participate, and they, and they had some interesting reasons that it could be dangerous in a very crowded bar if somebody's acting drunk. So, uh, but anyway, uh, to be nice here, I think that issue is extremely important to find out our being served when they've had too much in a way that we can help the permit holders in terms of trying to help them determine that and to help in terms of training that we can provide or in other things to help them reduce the incidence of that. And that's an excellent question. Okay. All right, end of our time. It seems I think we've been able to get to most of your questions. And we can't thank you again enough for uh, the time spent with us today and for your interest in the topic. And so I'll just let you add whatever you would like uh, in terms of closing comments. I want to thank your partnership on these issues. I know that um, deeply about your students and just know that we do too. And together we're going to be working on this issue um, throughout the, year col the college experience for your students. So thank you.